I am Brian Mays. Follow along on our adventures chasing all kinds of game in the heartland of America. Our passions run from the Northwoods rivers all the way out to the wild and wide open prairies. We are untamed and wild is all we chase. This is the Amazing Outdoors Podcast. Oh, that's a, that's a ski, dude. That's a mosquito. There's one on the tree right there. Oh, there goes another one. <laughs> that's a good way to start the morning. <laughs> I'm going to drink this in my beer quick. <laughs> What's going on, ladies and gents? Brian May is back for episode 82. Today's guest, Matt Russell of Double Arrow, Double Arrow Guide Service out of Arizona, Tucson, South Arizona quail hunting. Uh, we chat a little bit about what's going on down there with kind of a little bit of a poor season for bird numbers on Merns last year and uh, what kind of the status of state is, as well as uh, Matt has, 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 has a wonderful guide service, runs some great dogs. Uh, we get into hunting, about uh, talking about hunting down in Argentina. So it's a great episode. Uh, before I hit the roll button, I want to mention today's podcast sponsor, HW Launchers. If you're in the market for a bird launcher for your summer and spring training needs, head on over to hwlaunchers.com and uh, tell Jeremiah you heard about his pigeon launchers and pheasant launchers and bird launchers here on the Amazing Outdoors podcast. All right, episode 82. Right on, I got Matt from Double Arrow Guides, Matt Russell. Welcome to the Amazing Outdoors Podcast, man. Why don't you uh, give the listeners a little bit of uh, insight if they don't already follow you on social media and know who you are. Who, who the heck are you, man? Thanks a lot, man. appreciate you uh, having me on the show. Uh, Matt Russell, uh, owner and operator of Double Arrow Guides in Southern Arizona, a quail hunting outfit. Um yeah, uh, really passionate about uh, bird hunting, and of course about bird dogs, and um, just loving the Southwest. Not exactly right now because we're uh, summer is certainly upon us, but for eight months of the year, it's a pretty damn nice place to live. Yeah, I think I, you know, as I age, man, I, I'm, you know, the Northwoods, and it's kind of the opposite up up here. That's like eight months out of the year, it's it's crap. <laughs> and, and we got like four months out of the year that's really nice you know um i mean our, i i love our fall and you know i tack that on but uh oh man winter is just tough down up here and i look at some of these southern states that have birds and it's like at some point in my life i think i'm gonna try to spend more time down there <laughs> yeah it's, it's certainly Especially very, in the winter, very, man. Ugh. oh yeah it's a very sought after place to be uh to be hanging out for sure because you know, where else can you be in, uh, in the United States in January and have a 55, sometimes in my mind, an unfortunately 65 degree day, which is a bit warm to be running dogs out there. But, um, we do have some pretty gorgeous weather in the wintertime, man. I definitely was, uh, just amazed at, at, uh, I, I was down there two years ago and, um, that the last day I was there, it was 10 degrees in the morning. 10. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we, I mean, we were out in the desert, and so it gets a little colder, you know. It's amazing how cold the temperature can drop. And Certainly. And I, I picked up the last dog through in the box at, like, 1030 in the morning, and it was already 60. Oh, and yeah, I think yeah. It, that, 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 I, think it hit, I think it hit 70 that afternoon when we were driving. Yeah, the, the, the ball of fire, you know, uh, comes up and certainly warms up. If you had that 10-degree morning, that typically means just a – uh, a short, low pressure system came through the southwest and probably either tried to dump some precipitation, hopefully. If not, um, sometimes it does, uh, doesn't happen. So we just get the wind and then cold snap, clear morning, and then you have that snap. But then that clear morning, there's nothing to shelter the sun. So it comes out and uh, certainly heats up the desert uh, 
pretty quickly, but it's uh, pretty, it's a pretty amazing state. You know, we, we have a pretty diverse um, state anywhere from say San Francisco peaks uh, up in uh, Flagstaff at like, I think 12,300, the white mountain region. Is it that, you know, like that tall up there? Yeah, I think it's 12, three. And then uh, the white mountain region, there's a couple uh, 10,000, even approaching 11,000 foot peaks, like say in dusky bluegrass kind of country. Um, and even here in Southern Arizona and some of the mountain ranges here, we have a bunch of 9,000 foot, uh, peaks out here in the, in the, um, in the Southwest. So it's, it, you can certainly escape the heat if you need to in the summertime, but the wintertime, it, it, it lets you know, it's, it's not all about sand and desert and cactus. It'll, it'll, uh, it'll, it'll throw a curveball at you. Yeah, it, it was, it was actually quite refreshing. I, it, it had been pretty warm, um, while I was down there and that was the first like real crisp morning. I was like, Oh, it kind of got me prepared to go back north. <laughs> yeah. You know, if, if I could have but that afternoon, man, winter. that was like, Oh fuck, I gotta go back north. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. If, it, if it was twenties in the morning and you know, 45 and cloudy, then uh, that, that would be, uh, that'd be pretty top notch for me. But I still have yet to figure out how to control the weather. So I'm still working on it. I'm, I'm looking for the 25th hour of the day to figure that one out. Yeah. Right. Oh man. Yeah. So let's, let's talk a little bit about, you know, kind of the desert bird scene. I know you wanted to touch on that and man, it, the, the hunting opportunity that I saw two years ago was fantastic. And I really, I loved, I love the scaled quail. Um, I cursed a lot at the gambles quail every time they yeah. kind of decided to do a 90 degree bend into a, into a mesquite brush or whatever the hell's down in some of them, them washes. But yeah, it, it, it was, it was wild and it was some of the best uh, opportunities for a Northern guy who's used to shooting through freaking brush to go down and chase something new. It was, it was kind of magical for me. Yeah. Yeah. Gambles are, gambles are certainly the most widely spread quail that we have in the, in the state. Uh, why it's not our state bird, I don't know, but we showcase the cactus wren as our state bird, <laughs> which is not, uh, I don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure it's not nearly as widely spread as the gambles are because, you know, they're just a badass bird, man. They're, um, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've hunted them at lower elevation, uh, you know, say a thousand feet, maybe 1200 feet outside of the Phoenix area all the way up into say 5,500 feet in the junipers um, and anywhere in between. They're a very hardy bird, um, pretty diverse, you know, kind of habitat. And uh, they certainly adapt very well. And, you know, could you say you could take a gambles in juniper country and transplant them down in, in the Valley of Phoenix? No, they'd, they'd probably die. But um, if they're born, you know, they're, they're hatched in, uh, in higher elevation. That's all they know, you know, their short little lifespan and they certainly do adapt uh, quite well. And, you know, even in New Mexico, you know, I'd, um, you're definitely gotten into plenty of gambles up in what looks like typical Merns country and like junipers and oaks and stuff. And uh, gambles thrive there. So they're, um, they're definitely a very awesome bird and uh, definitely respected. They can be pretty crafty and savvy, yeah. just like their, uh, just like their colleagues, um, the scaled quail. And, you know, sometimes you can find some cool pockets to where, they do cohabitate and, you know, dog can go on point and, uh, you know, birds get up, you got gambles and, uh, sometimes, you know, it seems as though, uh, and this has happened, uh, seems as though dogs maybe, you know, finding a single goes on point and then probably a scaly strips out going, Shit, we were just chasing gambles here, you know? So it's, they, um, they're, they're both, uh, pretty badass birds. And I, I, you know, I, I love hunting, hunting them both. You know, if somebody wants to, folks on wing shooting, you know, and more shooting opportunities, you know, desert birds are just where, where it's at. And, you know, some people definitely despise, uh, scale quail because they are very notorious for being runners. And, uh, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, they're, you know what, what would you do? What would you do if a predator was coming? Was sitting around? No, you're probably going to want to boogie out. And, um, you know, they're, they're pretty typical. Both species are pretty typical for being wild flushers off in the distance. It's not that, not that you spooked them 50 yards out. They were probably just running the whole time. You can watch your dogs and realize, all right, we're getting some birds here somewhere. And then they bust out wild because, you know, just kind of that covey mentality. One, one bird gets airborne and all of them just sort of like, I don't know what the hell we're flying for, but he's flying, she's flying, I'm out of here. But um, I think that scaled quail are definitely very underestimated. You know, like a lot of people just don't like them, but I, I just don't think they've, they've quite figured them out yet, you know, but badass birds man i love them and they're gorgeous too both of those birds are gorgeous birds 
Yeah, I was when I when I first got my first gambles, I was kind of actually surprised at how how small they are. Um, I thought yeah. I thought they yeah. were going to be you know a little bit bigger than that, and it, it made a little more sense why I kept missing them. <laughs> yeah, there and they're, I don't know which one you you see more covey rises every every year than I've ever seen in my life. Um, which one do you think is faster on the wing? Faster on the wing. Man, flip a coin on that one. Yeah, you know, I mean, I uh, I can miss either of those two birds le- 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 like a pro, <laughs> you know. And then you can um, you can surprise your, uh, surprise yourself and and uh, really take one out, like on a long shot or just a fast rocket coming out. And you know, I'd say I'm a, I'm a pretty decent shot, but I I can miss them just like anyone else can. Um, I I honestly I don't think I could answer that question on which one truly is faster. You know. I, um, I, I guess I just need to get a radar gun and, uh, <laughs> along with a GPS and, uh, and some other equipment, I just need to carry a battery powered radar gun and hopefully I can pick up that and hopefully I can swing that gun faster than, than I can swing a shotgun. Yeah. I, I found, uh, and it was just my, you know, limited window of perception, but I found that the gambles quail were, they appeared to be faster. And I think it was only because, they, if they could duck into something, they would, and they'd, they'd bank 90 and just rock it on you. Um, where I found at least the scale coil that I got into f- flew a little straighter and they were like, Oh, I'm, I'm going to get the hell out of here. I'm not going to try to duck into the next piece of brush. Sure. Yeah. At least that was kind of what I, what I experienced when, when I got into a couple of different coveys of them and yeah. Yeah. And what surprised me the most too, is I'd gotten into a couple of really big coveys of gambles versus, you know, I don't know, dozen, maybe a little bit more on a big covey of scalies. So it was just like overwhelming almost. <laughs> like, yeah. Which, which, oh yeah. Like yeah. there's birds going everywhere. I can't tell you how many times I shot twice and a freaking bird still coming out. <laughs> sure. Yeah. It, it, if I could predict where the birds would fly and which direction, I guess I would probably categorize them as not wild birds. You yeah. Know? Like that, that's, that, that's the beauty of it. You know, that we certainly take it for granted here in the Southwest that we just have wild birds, you know, like why, why would you, unless like, so you have a puppy or something like that, or you're doing some dog training, like why, why would you go and quote unquote hunt pl- planted birds? You know, we were so I certainly take it for granted. Um, you know, but when I hear from our clients, um, all the time, yeah, you know, especially, you know, Midwest back East, the phrases are, we don't have any birds. There are no birds. And that's it. I'm like, oh, well, we just have plantations. We have uh, pen rays, you know, planted birds. And inside me, and like, I'm cringing, going, oh, I really feel sorry for you, but I'm really glad that you're in my field and you're enjoying this wild bird experience. And you know, I, I had a client, I don't know, several years ago, you know, inquiry, say you for email, we end up talking on the phone and he goes, so these are wild birds, right? And I said, oh, yes, they're about as wild as they're going to get, sir. And he goes, and he straight up says this, Brian. He goes, I can't tell you, Matt, the last time I saw a wild cubby rise. Oh, I said, well, that's one thing I can guarantee on one of my hunts. You will see a wild cubby rise. <laughs> you know, like, I, yeah, it's, it's hard for me to, of course, guarantee anything because it is wild bird hunting. And there are so many variables, you know, that can uh, and, and, and do not happen. But yes, sir, I, I can guarantee you that you will see a cubby rise. And that, that first cubby rise man, he was just smiling. He, he brought one of his friends out and, and he was in the same boat, you know, to where they just hadn't, you know, Bob White's obviously where we're talking about from Midwest back East. And they were of that generation to where they used to hunt them and then urban sprawl and definitely modern agriculture, just basically scrubbing down any bit of habitat to maximize every single crop. And that's the demise of, of, uh, of that poor bird, you know? So again, to bookend that statement, uh, we certainly take it for granted that we have wild birds out here. Well, and you've kind of in a unique um, space where, I mean, you, you do have a ton of development, but you do have a lot of land that is subpar for development. So, and, and these birds kind of thrive in some of those locations. So it's, it's a, a unique dynamic where, you know, Bob White's, they're in kind of a little bit more of a climate where the land can be used for, 
significant or multi-purposed and and they just kind of have been decimated because of a lot of different factors but some of them of what you mentioned so yeah, yeah having those wild birds you know you guys are you guys are a little spoiled down there i, I i'd say yeah. us, us, yeah. us grouse hunters are a little spoiled in that nature as well and some of the folks out in some of the prairie states but you look at back sure, east just, and yeah. in in that southwest part southeast part of the country and and some of those boys have have had a pretty tough shake of things yeah, yeah. I mean, but back to gambles being very resilient uh, and able to adapt to, um, you know, say those ele- those big elevation uh, ranges, but also just able to adapt to urban sprawl. Um, yeah. You know, track track home you know developments. You know, they're basically just you know home developer will scoop up a piece of state trust land and they buy it and they uh, scrub the whole thing down and then uh, build a shitload of homes. And but there's also you know, I can't really call them greenways because we don't, you know, it is green at, at times here in the Southwest, but, you know, uh, basically a dry wash bed, you know, um, to where it's not able to be developed because it is a waterway during the monsoons. And so the home developers plan out where the homes are going to go. And of course it'll just be straight parallel with, uh, with, with that, that dry wash bed drainage. Yeah. You're going to push the wildlife out, but they're so able to adapt to it that as soon as those homes are built and all that commotion is settled down, they still have that wash bed. They're still cruising up and down, but they're wondering like, wait, what, what happened to the rest of my habitat? Yeah. And then people set up their bird baths and bird feeders. My parents, you know, they, they, they put out a quail block, you know, they buy it from Costco. They put a quail block up on top of the wall. What do you think's eating it, Brian? <laughs> a bunch of quail. You know, but of course, a bunch of other birds and stuff, you know, and, but um, the, every time I go to see my parents, it's inevitable. I'll look, I'm like, oh, there they are. A bunch of gambles just hanging up on top of the wall. So they'll, they get pushed out, but they're, they're just, they're able to come back in. They're, they're a hardy, a really hardy bird. I, I can't say as much for scalies. Yeah. I think they're a little because, bit more temperamental. Yeah. And you know, they love the grasslands and stuff and you know, typically where the grasslands are, at least uh, in Arizona, you're definitely out in like ranch country or something, you know, to where a typical home builder is going to go, why would we buy this chunk of state trust and build 200 homes? Because, there's no town around here and, you know, supply and demand. So there's, would just, and there'd be no demand for a uh, track home community like that. So I, I can't really say that scale quail would be as resilient uh, and adaptable as gambles, but gambles, I see it firsthand all the time. Yeah. I see it in, in social media posts is freaking gambles right in somebody's front driveway. Or mm-hmm. whatever he runs through. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like we'll have clients, you know, they come out for a hunt and they, you know, their, their hunts over and then, they go back to say their Airbnb or they're hanging out at, you know, it's their friend's house before they fly out the next day. And then I'll get a picture texted to me like, hey, these little bastards are mocking me. And they're sitting <laughs> on top of their friend's back wall, you know, like as they're, you know, I'm, I'm basically pushing them through, uh, through the hills and they're, you know, doing eight to 10 miles a day with me. And they're, you know, they're, they're chasing after this bird going, they're right there. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty funny. <laughs> Happen. I love it, man. I love it. There's well, one of my clients uh, this last past season. Uh, he went back into town, back to his room. He was flying out the next day, and he sent me a picture of like a highway sign. Male gambles perched on top of a highway sign. He took a picture of it. He goes, he's saying goodbye. I'll see you next year. It's funny, man. <laughs> so what, what, what are the ebbs and flows of kind of these desert birds? Yeah, what causes a boom? I mean, obviously you have to have grass for, you know, the scale quail. So there's some rain elements in there. But, like, what else kind of? plays on the the flow and the cycle of these birds yeah good question man it's um yeah it's you know water is the basis of life we've all known that uh as long as i've been on this planet um but winter rains man winter rains are are basically they're they're crucial that's what they solely depend on and um you know a good wet winter will basically you know it's just kind of biologically you know like with uh uh you have wet ground. And then as the spring comes in, then obviously, you know, you have all those seeds have been hanging out and then, you know, you have seed germination. So great, you know, grass shoots will come up like vitamin A, you know, is in some of the grass shoots, which is great for a uh, little chicks to be uh, pecking at. And then what's really, really important is just insect production. And so, you know, what's, what's going to happen in the spring is the, the earth warms up, insect hatches will happen. And of course, like any little bird, even if you have a backyard chicken, you put it, you throw a worm into the chicken coops, 
those things are all over it. And so just like that, the little, little bird brain, um, will just basically, you know, any of those little insects, that's all about, um, what, what is going to be help out their survival rate. You know, they're, you know, they'll still pair up, you know, and they're, they're that, you know, they're actually putting out eggs right now. Um, I was I'm not seeing like, any. Yeah. When do they clutch? Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's eggs out right now. Um, uh, I've had some friends just actually just today, a friend texted me and picture in his backyard again at a track home community. I'm sure thing. And he said every year, man, they keep putting eggs out. So it's like every generation, they, you know, they keep coming back and, and laying eggs. Um, so yeah, they're definitely egg, eggs are out now and you know, probably not too far off from hatching really, uh, especially because man, it was almost, it was almost 90 today. You know, we're supposed to be eighties and nineties for the, the, the 10 day forecast. So that obviously that is definitely going to be triggering a lot of things. The Southwest is certainly greened up higher elevations, not quite so much right now. Um, but yeah, really just winter rains and, but gambles and scale, they're, um, they're, they're both resilient in the way that if we do have poor winter rains, which we do not have right now, we, we had a really wet winter, um, this, this past season, if we have poor winter rains, they'll still, you know, they're still paired up and, you know, biologically they're still going to crank out eggs and they're still going to hatch, but then the survival rates just going to be low. And so. You know, if, uh, you know, a, a covey is basically mom, dad, and all the little children kind of thing. So if they lose their, uh, entire covey and I've, I've seen it, not physically seen them lose it, but I've seen birds paired up and then you see chicks and then you see less chicks and less chicks. And then, you know, if it's late May or June and you see a pair of gambles, you're just telling yourself, shit, they, they just, they just lost all their babies, you know, and like full mortality rate. But then when you see chicks, you meaning like myself when, when I go out scouting, um, when you see little chicks running around late June and even in July, basically when our monsoons, if they were to come in, they just get biologically triggered. Well, we lost our whole family. Uh, we're still paired up. And now we have uh, winter rain, or I'm sorry, summer rains and then insect production. And then, so they'll just try it again. So, you know, it's, it's not, I don't have a biology degree or anything, but seeing a lot of things firsthand, boots on the ground or just driving roads. When you see dicks on desert birds in July going, man, you lost your whole family. And then at the same time, you see like juveniles or adolescents going, okay, same time frame. It's still July. You have chicks and you have like little juveniles. You had a good survival rate and that, and, uh, that, that pair didn't. So it's uh, pretty interesting, you know, when, when you find some really young birds that you can take in, uh, in October, November, those young birds, you just realized, man, that was a second hatch. Not, not that they literally had two families, but they just had a second hatch because they had a, just a full die off and everything. So, and I've seen some young scalies too, early season, you know, early season birds going, Whoa, that's a small bird right there. Like still camouflage feathers, fluttering, not even flushing and flying to realizing, cool. So, um, you lost all of your chicks. And, and so it's really interesting to see as the years go by. Do they, uh, <clears throat> do either one of them, will they pull off a full on second clutch or will those, because you have such a long warm season, Yeah. do they, do they you, at all have that opportunity to do that? You, you know, from what I've witnessed, yeah. um, again, not from, uh, um, not from like a, a biology kind of background, to me, it would not make sense for a pair to have a second family because, you know, their safety in numbers, you know, it's a covey bird. So if they have a family and say, you know, say a hen puts out 15 eggs or something like that and 10 survive, well, that's, that's their covey and that's their family for the entire season kind of thing. And so, and then they will not split up until they pair up that, that next spring. So okay. yeah. to me, to I, me, from what I, I yeah, from what, sure. yeah, from what I would have witnessed, um, no, I have not seen, uh, nor speculated that a pair would say, cool, we made this family fly the coop. We're, we're going to get busy again. I, I really don't see that happening, you know, when, but again, it's just, just from what I witnessed in, in the field. Yeah, there's, there's always, I hear guys talk about, you know, second, second hatches on, um, pheasants and stuff like that up North here. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of of the mindset the something didn't happen in the first nesting opportunity or nesting, uh, cycle. And they, yeah. they had a second successful clutch. Yeah. Um, their their they job is to survive and to reproduce. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't brood 
two sets of 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 hatches each you know each year it was just a I, an, another nesting opportunity that it sounds like a lot of work you know for one, yeah, yeah. one bird like all right now you you youngsters here you guys behave because uh dad and i are going to go in the bush and make some busy happening here and then we're gonna have a bunch of little brothers and sisters i don't see that happening yeah that's kind of what i figured my most birds that's that's kind of how they do it except for pigeons they just they're like rats. They just keep redu- reproducing. Rats with wings, man. <laughs> yeah. 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 Although my pigeons, for some reason, they're they're not always successful at it. So it's maybe, yeah. maybe that's why yeah. they reproduce so much. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah, I've, I've had some homing pigeons, and um, man, when that that little pigeon, that little chick hatches, and it's out of that egg. The first thing I look at that at that pigeon, I'm like, man, you're gonna die. Yeah, <laughs> it is absolutely helpless. The thing can't even support. And his neck is flopped over. All you see is just pale pink skin. And like, oh man, you're gonna die. And then day after day, like, oh, he's starting to hold his head. All right. Oh, well, we're starting to get some like little quills. And then, bam, 35 days later, like, you are actually a full what appears to be a full size pigeon. Like, you're not gonna be flying. You're still being fed by mom and dad. But man, you're actually a bird right now in 35 days. It's, it's really cool for, for people that have not witnessed how fast a bird grows. It, it's fascinating. It really is. But then you have a quail who are not fed by mom and dad. They're literally just watching and learning. You know, like, I mean, as soon as they're hatched, they're feeding themselves. You know, they're, they're, it's not like a dove. It's not like a pigeon where they're sitting on a nest waiting for mom and dad to bring them food. And if that doesn't happen, they're done. But quail, they're just out there foraging with mom and dad. Again, insects, you know, a tiny little bird, the little bird brain goes, Ooh, that's moving. I, I want to eat that. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. I brooded some quail last year and that, that was kind of one of the amazing things. Like literally they came out of the eggs, moved into the brooder and they're, they're eating. And it's like, yes. <laughs> How did you learn? It's that? fascinating. <laughs> man. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. Oh shit. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about Merns. That's kind of what, what sparked the, the conversation and, and there's, I think some definitely draw down to the southeast, specifically for Mern's quail. They are a gorgeous bird and a lot of fun to hunt. But there's a lot more to it that a lot of us out-of-staters don't really know. And I'd like to kind of get the insides of, you know, what's going on down there currently. You got a little bit of a thing going on with the fish and game that you're advocating for, or um, at least in conversations with them to kind of, yeah, lay the land. Because you guys also, they don't, they, the season dates change on Mern's quail, unlike the scaly and gambles, if I'm correct with that, right? Yeah, just recently that, that has, has changed. Uh, in the past, it basically just been, at least to, I'll just say for my generation, um, the desert birds, you know, because they do, you know, pair up and, and hatch uh, way earlier in the season because, again, they solely depend on those winter rains. Um, Merns, they're just they're late bloomers. You know, they're they're waiting for those monsoons, and so again, biologically, if they were to be cranking out chicks, and you know, say right now, like with the um, uh, like the two desert birds are, they're, they're, there's just no food for them, you know, out there, and so they've obviously, you know, they're a tiny little bird like that. They're pretty smart. They realize that um, we just need to wait for our rains, you know, the, the summer rains for uh, for insects. And, um, so yeah, they're, they're certainly a very special and sensitive bird and they, they certainly need to have, uh, a lot of awareness brought to them. Um, you know, they're a bucket list bird. Of course, we have a lot of inquiries with our guided hunts and we just have to be transparent with our, uh, with our clients and educate them, um, you know, almost as, uh, ambassadors for game and fish. You know, if, if one does not know about them, they, they need to know about them, you know, versus just coming out and going, that's the best holding bird I can ever have in front of my pointer. Well, yes, but it's also much a much smaller covey bird. Um, their defense mechanism is to sit down and, and hold tight, which makes it really nice for for pointing dog and uh, for hunting them. Uh, but that also is kind of uh, you know the, not really the demise to the to, to their their populations, but um, you know you're still threading the needle. You know when that covey gets up, you're threading the needle, kind of almost up in your country. You're shooting to the trees, but um, you know, a pretty good wing shooter can still get on top of them pretty quick. And you can do a lot of damage to a Merns Covey really quick um, because once they flush and then they sit down, they're just going to sit down and hold tight because like, it's a Covey bird. You just busted their Covey and they're going to wait for, for the rest of them to, to call back in. 
they're not vocal, um, uh, not nearly as much as the two desert bird species. Again, the defensive mechanism is just to sit down and hold tight. And oh. so if you have a good pointer, you're going to, you're going to, uh, hunters can do a lot of damage. They can pick off singles real easily. So, um, um, you know, say, uh, uh, on a good year, either be a 10, 15 bird cubby. That would be fantastic. But sometimes they just average eight, no more than 10 in the beginning of the season. Obviously they already got picked off by, by, you know, natural predators anyways. So hunters can certainly do a lot of damage to them, you know? So, um, them not coming up real quick. Um, sometimes they'll hurts to two hours. Uh, they're, they're, they, they do vocalize, but they're not vocal say gambles. I mean, gambles and scale, both of them, you can bust a cubby and I've had them call back anywhere from 30 seconds after they landed to two minutes to 20 minutes and anywhere in between there. Again, wild birds, you can't really predict what they're going to do, but merns are just going to sit down and hold tight. And so, you know, hunting them late in the afternoon, um, not really good for them. You know, it's just, you know, you bust a cubby at four or five o'clock in the evening and uh, they don't cubby up to two hours, do the math, that sun's down. And on, say, your 10 degree morning that you were speaking of, uh, you're going to unknowingly, uh, until you're educated on, on the species, you're going you're gonna to kill that cubby. And not even with your shotgun. It's just because they didn't cubby up, they're not safe from predators, and they're going to freeze at nighttime because they need to you know, stick together and stay warm. So there's, there's just so many, um, uh, so many sensitive aspects to the species that a lot of people need to be aware of. and um, you know, just to make sure that they're, they're, they're there for the next season and, uh, and, and the next generation kind of thing. So is it really like the elevation or is it limited cover? I mean, what, what is kind of some of the outside, I mean, obviously they're inherent traits of, you know, holding tight and, and being able to kind of, like you said, do some damage with a pointing dog. Um, like what are there, is there a lot of natural predation on these birds? What, what are kind of some of the big factors that kind of make this, this so sensitive? That yeah. This you know, so sensitive? yeah, it, it's definitely, uh, probably the, the least, uh, like the, the bird that we probably know the least about, you know, and you, know, you can have X number of field days or you can be a biologist and, and studying them, um, on some, uh, you know, some, you know, some good years and bad years and rainfalls and all that. Um, you know, as far as predators, I mean, you know, it, you got snakes, skunks, bobcats, anything like that. You know, I, I would, I personally would have a hard time seeing a coyote really, you know, unless they actually find the eggs, you know, to like eat the eggs and actually like pick off some chicks. But as far as like adults, you know, I mean, Merns can, I mean, they can shoot out like rockets, you know, I mean, they're, they're again, another badass bird and definitely to be respected. Um, but as far as, you know, predators, plenty of predators, the ones that, that I listed out there. Um, I'm not so sure about like overhead, like hawks, because they are, the Merns are, they're just so well camouflaged. Oh, and again, again, that's part of their defense mechanism to sit down, hold tight, squat down and flatten themselves and hope you don't see me just keep on walking by. And so, you know, that the fact that they are literally, you know, the, the phrase would be sitting ducks, but of course they're not ducks, but you know what I mean? They're, they're just sitting there, you know, uh, waiting, waiting for the predator to, to pass over. But, you know, um, every upland bird needs some good cover, you know, and here in the Southwest would be grass, you know, and where they're at and say oaks and junipers and stuff, uh, that certainly does help. Um, you know, any of the, the large trees, they will, produce a lot of compost, you know, year round. We have a bunch of live oaks out here and uh, nothing like Eastern oaks that drop all their leaves all at once. These oaks just, they drop their leaves year round. And so, and they're actually dropping leaves right now uh, for springtime. So, uh, which is opposite of what Eastern oaks would be, but all that, all the leaf droppings is just compost, you know, year after year. And what, what holds compost, you know, like, you know, holds moisture is the compost. And then, what do you think is underneath that moisture? That's going to be a bunch of insects and everything. So they, they certainly do need that, but grass cover is very, very important, you know? Um, and they're, uh, they're not that bird that's going to be gravitating towards a water source because there really isn't a lot of water sources unless we have a good monsoon and it pools up in some rocks. Our monsoons dump a shitload of water all at once and then poof, it's gone. You know, it just keeps flowing downhill. So, you know, they get most of their water um, underground. And their foods, most of their foods underground after the insect hatch. So, um, you know, it's their, they, 
they really love oxalis tubers, uh, wood sorrel, um, peppery bean, um, you know, so I mean, they, they have a pretty diverse diet, I guess, but, um, w- when you do open up a crop and just realize, yep, they're just hitting, you know, oxalis tubers and, um, which is basically, I equate it to, uh, like a potato, you know, a potato is like that water satchel, that, that, uh, ball of nutrients with a bunch of moisture in it. And then on top of the surface, you have the potato vine itself, but you're, you know, we're you and I, like as humans, we're eating that potato. That's what the men's are eating that little mini potato underneath there, which is nutrients. And also it's a little water source underneath there. So they're, 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 they're pretty crafty and done a lot of research on the birds trying to figure out how do they know it's under there? (laughs) Like they're, they're, they're they're just going for a certain area, but I mean, they'll, they'll excavate certain areas and their whole crops are just full of these little tubers. They're, they're, they're crafty little birds, man. What kind of elevation do these these birds hang out at? Because I oh, think sorry, you, you asked that man. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I I I mean I found them up in the mountains, but like I, I the reason I'm asking too is uh, obviously the biological perspective. But when I was down there, I was like, man, there's there's some really you know rough country up higher. Oh, like yeah. You know, and and I was as the guide in me, I'm kind of like looking for unpressured spots like or or where sure. pe- places people didn't want to go and i'm like you know there's got to be better bird numbers there you know people don't go there yeah um yeah, so yeah. I, like i mean I, I, will they be at the top of some of these these peaks if there's the right conditions up there or, or are they kind of do they yeah yeah explain the elevation thing with with the merns yeah sure so uh i've gotten into merns as low as 4500 feet like almost in grasslands, kind of like thinking outside the box where there's not a single oak tree in sight um, or juniper for that matter. And then uh, their little sweet spot, I say, is between five and 6,000 feet. Uh, and yeah, definitely, you know, gnarly country, man. You know, just, um, but, you know, they're, they're just wandering around on two little feet, you know I mean? Can they hike up, you know, relative to their size? You know, they're, they're climbing mountains themselves, you know. So, yeah, yeah. yeah ro- uh, ro- rocky drainages, you know, grass, uh, grass hillsides with, with trees. Um, there's actually some parts up in northern Arizona to where they're, they've uh, they've been seeing it, you know, nine, ten thousand foot elevations, you know, to where like you're in elk country, you know, or or, or, or grouse country. Um, so one would not really gravitate there going, oh, I'm going to go learn something at 9,000 feet. One would go, why the hell are you doing that? Dude? You know, that's, you know, there, there's there are plenty of other places, but you know, if you want to think out, that's a, the other side of the, you know, thinking outside the box, you know, you got grasslands or just, you know, start hooking it up into, into, into grass country. And uh, so, yeah, they're, they do have a sweet spot, but they can adapt to um, different kind of landscapes. And, uh, but there's, they're still kind of going after almost that same, vegetation too so it's um again interesting bird so you've got definitely a passion for these birds and recently you you know you've spent some time waiting to to get three minutes to speak with fish and game can you kind of enlighten us a little bit about what specifically you know you're advocating at least at this point yeah it's basically for you and some other outfitters as well because i know you you communicate with them yeah yeah sure it's it's basically just bringing awareness you know to to the bird you know and to, to make sure that uh, in state or out of state hunters, when when they come to Arizona, uh, that it is just a very special and sensitive bird, and that you know it's there's been talks about lowering the limit, you know, and that that, that just hasn't happened, or or possibly um, implementing a MERN stamp or a, like a permit kind of thing, because you know I, I've you know I've hunted a lot of western states, maybe eight or nine western states, and you know when when you go to uh, click, you know, like check out on your, your shopping cart, if you will, buying your license and you're like, Oh, you can't check out until you click on this conservation permit stamp thing. It's a, uh, not a, not a tangible stamp, but you have to, you have to click on this, uh, you know, uh, habitat conservation, you know, say it's two bucks or so where, where the hell it ends up being. But, uh, there really is just nothing for that here. And so we're, we're trying to, trying to implement something along that nature, again, to bring awareness and, uh, and let people know that, yeah, it's a bucket list bird, but, you know, to come out here and, uh, just, you know, be going for limits, you know, day after day, whether it happens or not, it's, that's, that's not the objective, you know, it's, uh, you know, bird in the bag is certainly nice. Um, but at the end of the day, 
you know, you got three merns in, in, in your bag. I'm going to say, consider yourself very fortunate and enjoy that bird, that species, the, the, the habitat and the landscape and the, you know, the camaraderie and, you know, the company. And, and, uh, it's just, it's a different part of the hunt. You know, it's not all about killing. Well, I think that, you know, there's a, there's a good portion of, you know, guys that have gotten into wing shooting and have dogs that respect that, you know, it's about the experience. Um, unfortunately I think, you know, with uh, the advent of a lot of younger hunters who maybe haven't been brought up in the scenario, or I I know some older guys that just got to kill, you know, um, that's one of these things that, you know, we, as guides, I think we, you know, have a responsibility to kind of educate people on, you know, even rough grouse, you look at out East, you know, I got guys come up from Virginia, kind of give me the same story about wild birds, you know, and it's like, yeah, man, I remember, you know, back in the nineties, we used to be able to go out and shoot some birds. And now I hike 10 miles and lucky to see one bird, you know? And it's like, yeah, those guys really do appreciate it. But there's the younger generation who sometimes don't, but I even see, like I said, old guys who just, you know, got to kill and I, I always have to remind people, you know, this is a game where we count flushes, not necessarily birds in the bag. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Th- th- this last season, you know, when clients were, you know, so let's just say one year ago, you know, say last spring when people were inquiring about, you know, this, this, you know, what would have been the upcoming season just this last uh, season. Um, you know, when, you know, in, you know, inquiring about, you know, um, what, what to expect, and, you know, bucket list bird, of course, you know, Merns being, that's where we just have to be transparent saying, Hey guys, it's, it's not a good year. We didn't receive our monsoons. They were not on time, nor were they abundant. They certainly were not extended. And so, you know, um, can we go Merns hunting? Yes. Uh, but if you have a three day hunt, we're going to, we're going to hunt Merns one day and we'll, we're going to be in the desert for the other two. We're still going to have a great time, but we can't pump the shit out of these birds, you know? And, and as long as, you know, we as the outfitters are upfront and transparent with people, ahead of time. So there's no surprises like, Oh, what do you, what do you mean? We're not hunting for three days. You know, well, that, that, that would be my fault. And that would be the outfitter's fault for not, um, you know, again, educating that, you know, the, the client on that. And everyone has been so receptive to it because I think that they are just good, good upland ethical hunters, you know, and, you know, it doesn't matter if, you know, somebody's 30, 40 or, you know, a lot of these guys that, you know, they're, they're, you know, a lot of our clients, they're certainly in their sixties, if not seventies they've had their fair share. Like they've, they've bird hunted. I'm sure they've killed thousands of birds. And once you convey that message of the sensitivity and how special the bird is and say it's a down year, they'll go, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll listen to you. And yeah, let, let's just give it a whirl. Let's just give it uh, on one day. And uh, you know, we, we'll, we won't chase singles. We'll just shoot on that cubby rise and then we'll move on. Yes. Cool. Uh, you, you're, well, let's book this, you know, like that, that's what we're looking for. You know, just a, more of a, a quality, uh, not the quantity hunt with them. And then, you know, desert birds, it's not like, you know, certainly don't want to just go back in the desert and just pound all of them, but there certainly are more of them. And there are, they're just much more resilient birds. They can bounce back <laughs> whether they do or do not have their, their winter rains. Again, they're just much more resilient birds. Merns, it's one and done. They, they, they pair up early, but then they, they don't put eggs out until August. Oh, and, really? and, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, chicks until August. And I've seen it firsthand out on archery uh, deer hunt out in classic Burns country. I'm out there in full camo, snake gators and everything, walking through green grass. And man, scared the shit out of me. I see what I thought was a snake slithering through and my, my heart just jumped. It was a trail of tiny little Burns chicks, you know, following, following the hen. And, uh, and this is in August. And then that's, uh, that's just when, when it happens. And so, you start doing the math, you know, I guess you got September, October, November, December, boom, you got four months, you know, opening week and they're four month old birds, <laughs> you know, like that's, um, it's, it's pretty early, you know, in the, in the season. So, you know, and you have that same December that you got, you know, birds that were hatched in, in April, you know, they're, they're just, you know, a, a lot bigger birds and, you know, pretty damn sporting, I would say, even on early desert birds. So you brought it up, man. I think every Northern hunter, and most people that live outside of the Southwest, <clears throat> snakes are always a big concern for people. What's the skinny on like the snake situation down there and just hunting in general? I, you know, I, I definitely was on my mind when I was down there. Luckily, it yeah. did not have any encounters, but, um, 
but yeah, it, it, it's, it's, I'm sure it's a top question you get from clients that are coming down. Definitely. Yeah. It, it's, de- it's definitely the real deal. You know, um, uh, I believe, uh, don't quote me on this, but I think, I believe Arizona has 13 different species of rattlesnakes. And I think 10 or 11 of which are in Southern Arizona. Um, so, um, each snake will just adapt to its own habitat and you know, camouflage size and everything. And, um, you know, uh, I tell my clients whether they ask it up front or not, I say snakes are out 12 months a year. They're just not out 365 days of the year. So, um, I mean, I, I've seen snakes in January. I, I, I saw a Mojave this last, maybe the end of December, beginning of January or something like that. It, it wasn't an abnormally warm day, but it was the fact that all the night, the cumulative nights just prior to this day that we saw the snake, they were like, mid forties and even like, you know, a cloudy, a cloudy night, it was like low fifties. I'm like, Oh shit. Every time I see that forecasting and like getting into fifties at night or forties when you're dancing with the devil, man, you know, it's just, you know, they're, they're out there and they just get triggered and like, Oh, the crown's heating up. I guess it's time. And they'll come out for a snack. So, you know, they're, they're not going to be nearly as active as they are being a cold blooded animal, but, uh, you know, if they haven't eaten in a while, they got plenty of venom, uh, in those fangs. And so when they make contact, uh, it's probably not a dry bite. So it's, um, yeah, definitely the real deal. Um, you know, the more grass, the better for quail, but you know, there's a lot of animals that, that live in the grass and that seek shelter, uh, in the grass for their own habitat. So, you know, quail certainly cohabitate with a lot of different, uh, snake species, uh, Western diamondback, obviously, uh, pretty widely spread in Arizona. The Mojave is also uh, pretty widely spread in Southern Arizona. Um, Mojave's a little bit, a little bit smaller. Um, and typically they strike first and ask questions later. So, uh, this one in particular actually did let us know that he was there and, uh, you know, everybody's heart jumps and everything. I basically told the old guys, I'm like, get out of the way. I, I think I body checked one, one of the old guys, you know, that, that was with me or something <laughs> respectfully calling him, calling an old guy, you know, um, yeah, he didn't hear it nor see it. I didn't see it. I just heard it. So it's, um, yeah, definitely real deal, man. You know, I had one of my girls, uh, one of my dogs struck by a Western Diamondback. She's 12 now, and I think she's going to be a year, year, no more than a year and a half, maybe even, yeah, maybe just a year. She got struck in the chest by a Western Diamondback out in Gamble's country. Almost killed her, Brian. Yeah. Almost killed her, dude. You know, three, four nights in ICU, only one vial of antivenin. Uh, but, man, she was she was hurting, definitely hurting. And, you know, that, that definitely hits home. It could, could have been a hell of a lot worse, of course, but... You know, I tell this story now to you and of course the listeners, it's real and, and it can happen. Uh, it's, it's, I, hope, um, I, I don't mean to be negative or a pessimist or anything, but it, it's almost inevitable. You know, the, the more days you put your dog down in the desert, you're just going to increase your chances. You know, unfortunately I haven't had any incident since, but it's, it's, it's out there, you know? So yeah, you, you have to tell the stories. Uh, so other people listen because they can't say hey, that's not going to happen to me or, yeah, hey, it was, it was pretty cold last night. No, you, you need a lot of 20, 30 degree nights, if not less multiple in order to trigger those, uh, those snakes to go under and, and hopefully stay under. I, it was one of the reasons why I, I, I kind of hunted the way I did too. When I went down, I, I chose to hunt and put my eggs in the baskets in the days that it was, it was cold overnight, real cold. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. When I saw that 10 degrees, I was like, okay, we, we, I can kind of move that back in the, in the head a little bit. And as soon as it, you know, got close to that 60 degree mark, I knew that what was, I mean, I was packing out, I was heading home. So it wasn't, yeah. know, like it wasn't too and, terrible, but, but you know, if I was down there for a few more days, I, I would have been looking to call, uh, put them up for the day. And, you know, yeah. I'm trying to extend my trip too and conserve dog power and, and that type of thing. So it's, it's not a horrible decision for a guy like me who's there for a few days to put dogs up when it hit 60, uh, 65 degrees. Pretty, pretty you know? smart actually. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, being a guide, it's like, you know, I mean, clients come from all around the nation, you know, they're, spend a lot of money on, on plane travel and, and rental cars and lodging and of course our services. And who am I to say, I mean, it, there has been a couple times to where, you know, it's, it's approaching, you know, I see the forecast going guys, it's, it's going to be pretty warm. Uh, let's start the hunt one hour earlier than we normally would when we need to cut out one earlier, uh, one hour earlier in the afternoon. You know, it, it, I, I think that's the, the smart thing to do, but you know, there's still that, 
early afternoon before say three o'clock or something that something could totally happen. Um, but you know, I mean, you know, the, the more water you're drinking, the more uh, the water the dogs are drinking, you know, and I mean, my dogs are so important to me, you know, I, uh, I, they are my children and, um, I love them, you know, and they, I can't, I can't do my job without them. And so they're, they're a very important part of my life, uh, and, and, and the business. And so, you know, when I say, Hey guys, can we take five for the dogs in the shade? I haven't had a single client saying what? No, let's keep pushing on. Cause they see it. the dogs are coming checking in for water left and right. It's, it's those days that, that, that definitely get to you going, man, I, I hope we make it through this day, you know? And they're like, I'm doing my job. The dogs are doing their job but my dogs trust me, you know? And, uh, and when, you know, when, when you fail your dog, uh, because they do trust you, it hurts, man. It definitely does. Yeah. I know that feeling all too well. I've, I've had incidents, not snake bites, but incidents. And it's, uh, all, most of the time it's, it's been due to me pushing the dogs too much. And, uh, sure. you know, it's, I, I, I couldn't have said it any better, man. I love my dogs. They're super important to my business. Couldn't do it without them. Like that's the bottom oh. line, you know? <laughs> yeah. So you have to, to keep it. I, we're, we're pretty lucky that, you know, most of the time, unless it's really early season, um, you know, we're dealing with like 40, 45 degree days a lot of times in, man, in the fall. That's nice. So yeah, there's there, they don't suck up water as much as, uh, you know, they do at 60 degrees or, or more. Oh yeah. Uh, so. I mean, that's, you know, it's, uh, I, I tell myself and others that water is like gold, you know, uh, out there. And, you know, they're, you're, you're not going to, you know, if our clients bring in dogs, you know, you know, Hey, can I, can I hunt my dog? Sure. As long as they get, they get along well with each other, make sure you hold what, you know, you're packing water, the water I'm carrying on, on my back is for my dogs and me, my dogs get water first and I can ration because I'm just walking, you know, through the field, but you know, dogs are running, you know, you know, seven, eight, 10 mile an hour kind of thing. I got dogs on GPS. So of course I, I know those stats, and uh, they're working their asses off out there, and that water's for them first. And it's not for my clients; it's not for their dogs. You huff your own on water out there if you're bringing your dog. Um, you know, I, I carry a 100 ounce bladder, and then 232. So I got 164 ounces, and then I go through my 232s first, and then you know I can feel the you know the the, the water bladder on my back, and as, as the as the time goes by during that hunt, I'll go back there and I'll slosh it around. And, and I'm very upfront with my clients saying, Hey guys, we're about, I'm about halfway through my water. Uh, the hunt's not over, but let's just take a long horseshoe, you know, curve and let's just head back towards the truck. Let's hit another drainage, you know, and just, you know, hunt's not over, but you know, I'm halfway through my water and I, I, I can't conserve water for my dogs. And so, but and again, as, as long as you're upfront with, with, with your clients, everyone's totally cool with it because they know they can't hunt without my dogs. Yeah, there's, there's, there's things, man, I, I, you know, when I went down there, I was, I had the same experience because you're not just stumbling across a water hole unless, you know, you, <laughs> the only place I ever saw it was up in Murns country where, you know, there was a couple spots where dogs could jump in and cool a, off. A couple, a couple, yeah. A couple. Yeah, if not, it, it, it's a nasty dirt cattle tank. And, uh, I, I prefer her to ration my water for myself and give it all <laughs> my dogs first, like, you know, well, I, if it's a, you know, if a one day, you know, do I do want to cool themselves down? Sure. But I don't need my dogs shitting themselves because they drank out of a cattle tank when I had 40 ounces of fresh, clean water on my, on my back. Yeah. I don't need that. Yeah. Yep, exactly. But you know, up here, shit, we get freaking creeks and all that other stuff. And usually oh, man. in the, in the, yeah. in the fall, it, it gets kind of wet. So we got pockets in the woods where there's, I mean, I, I don't carry as much, but I carry close to what you carry. Even, okay, in, even, okay. even, even this time, you know, and a lot of times I'm going back to the truck with water, but it's, it's one of those things, man, if they need it, I want to have it. Yes. So we, we brought up the dog question, man. And, and you, I, I, I don't even, I can't even go about pronouncing other than Brock. It's not a Brock say. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's a little bit no. of a different dog breed. And I've, I've, I've seen them i've seen pictures of them they they kind of have that short hair look like some of the other dogs that are in that that category but give us a skinny on what kind of dogs you run man yeah sure it's brock du bourbonnet um i'm not french but that's the best i can pronounce it throughout the last uh, kind of what it is yes french pointer yeah so brock meaning you know pointer in french du you know meaning of uh and then bourbonnet is the region of bourbonnet france 
So um, their their bloodline uh, goes back a little bit further than the German short hair pointer. Uh, however, they're just uh, they just obviously not that common. I think maybe there's about 800 alive in the U.S. right now, and um, uh, they were uh, they were almost wiped out in the forties in France due to world war two, you know, a lot, a lot of things died in the, in the war. And of course, you know, people and, uh, and, and other animals, including dogs. So this, this breed was almost wiped out in the forties. Um, it was brought back in France in the mid sixties, kind of, kind of made a comeback. And it wasn't introduced to the U S until like the late eighties by a gentleman named Michael Comte. So, uh, he and his dad were, um, um, definitely pioneers in, uh, in bringing, the, uh, the, the dog back in France. And then they were introduced to the U S in the late eighties. So, you know, you, you got 30 some years, uh, yeah, somewhere, somewhere around there, 30 years. And, um, and that's why there's, you know, I, I think the last litter that we had, I think they're registered somewhere around 12 or 1300 in the U S with, with NAVDA. And so do the math in 30 years, half of them are dead, you know, with, with a dog's lifespan, the lifespan is somewhere between 12, between 12 and 15. Uh, one of our girls is 12 right now and she's still in great shape. Um, you know, I, I keep her in great shape, a uh, hell of a hunter, um, great disposition at home. And then when they get in the field, it's like, like that switch, you know, there's, um, they, they know when, when it's time to work and, and, and there's plenty of breeds like that, you know, that, that do have that switch. And there's also some breeds that they don't have a switch. And what the hell are you going to do with that dog for the other eight months of the year that you can't hunt them? They just go berserk, you know, and they, you know, they, they need to, to work and stuff. So they're you know, definitely a good family dog. Um, I don't have kids, but, um, you know, we, we try to actually bring our dogs around other, other people's kids at a young age because it's really interesting the dog's behavior. That they're not around children. Like they'll, they'll growl and bark at them going, I don't know what you are. You, you kind of look like a human, but you're, you're definitely not the size of a human. So we try to, uh, uh, basically bring our dogs around some other people's children without, you know, having them attack them, of course. But, um, uh, really, really cool breed. And everyone gets attached to a breed, you know, and so we're certainly partial to them and great size too, man. I mean, one of our biggest girls is 43 or so. Uh, we have one of our girls is 30 pounds. Uh, oh, so they're the a little bit, have, little bit smaller than say, a definitely smaller. Shirt, yeah. 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 I, I think like a, I think a big male bourbon, a would maybe be 50, probably no more than 55 pounds. But, um, uh, uh one of the males that I hunt, uh, that's actually the sire to two of our litters. Uh, we don't own him, but we, we train him and, and hunt him. He's 43, 44, 45 pounds, somewhere around there. And so it's, it's just a nice compact dog, you know, especially here in the Southwest in from what I'm doing, I don't need a 60, 70 pound GSP or a drop car or something like that. Uh, you know, big long haired dog, dude, they, they, they get roasted out here in no time, 10, 11 o'clock, they're done. Um, so, you know, th these girls, I mean, you know, I have enough dogs that I can rotate them out throughout the day. Each dog will probably get a two to three hour shift on, on an average hunt. And, uh, and then they just recharge and they're ready to go the next day. So it's, it's nice to have more dogs just so you don't, you, you don't burn out your dog power, but, um, yeah, great size, great disposition. Um, nice coloring that they have a bunch of ticking, you know, uh, some of them have ticking. Um, uh, one of the girls that, that we bred, we, we intentionally bred her because of her size. She's like 37 pounds, uh, full grown and primarily white with a lot of liver ticking all over it. So easy visibility in the field at a, at a distance. And, uh, you know, the, uh, in France, they don't cut the tails, but we here in America, we, we like changing it up here. And so, uh, their tails are definitely cut here, but yeah, overall love the breed. I've had plenty of my friends who will probably listen to this podcast. Uh, Jim, Eric, Scooter, uh, shit. Hopefully that's everyone. Um, and, that kind of just kind of fell in love with some of our, our earlier dogs and went, yeah, I, I want one of those too. So they, they come in a fawn color and a liver color, usually with ticking uh, involved. Are they uh, particularly rangy dogs? You know, is there, is there like a range category you could put on them or are they kind of, even in my short hairs, like they're all bred very closely and uh, they all have different, different ranges. So that's yeah, a tough it, question, man. It's kind of relative. It, it, it to definitely the is. Yeah. They run in. Definitely a good question. Yeah. You know, it's, um, I, I think every, each dog, no matter the breed has their strength and weakness. Um, I have a couple of girls that, uh, pretty close rangers, you know, I got one girl, she won't go more than 50 yards and I've tried, but you know what? 
if that's if that's her strength, and I will not consider that a weakness, you know, she'll be picking up some singles. She's probably not going to be pointing cubbies. And um, I got one girl. Uh, those of you that follow me, I guess I'll throw this out there. Gun dog run on Instagram. Uh, Quiver. Quiver is my star dog, man. That that girl. This last season, she uh, both desert birds. So I'll just say the first one of gambles was uh, 430 yards out, and she was on point. Because she's she's that seek and destroy kind of dog, you know. Like there's nothing in front of good casting. I mean, great athleticism in her. She's my tallest girl. She's she's probably still 40, 42 pounds, but just real tall. And then there's another covey as I'll just say O'Scaly said she was like three seventy out, you know. And you know sometimes that works for the hunter, and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I mean, for me, I don't mind because you know what. She, I saw her cast off 200 off to the left. Clearly, there's nothing there because she's casting back. And then she hones in on something. Sweet. GPS tells you, ding, ding, she's on point. You might want to hustle to get up there. She'll hold. Uh, wild birds, I can't guarantee you they'll hold. But it's sometimes with clients, you know, uh, judging their hiking abilities and, you know, their, their fitness level, sometimes that's too far. You know, like they can't get there in time. And, um, you know, nothing against my dog. Maybe I, I didn't even see it. But, you know, if she breaks, I'm thinking, shit, they were just running, you know. And, when I, you know, tell, tell the guys like, Hey guys, hustle. You know, these birds aren't going to be waiting. You know, they're not going to hang around waiting to be killed. Some, some guys just can't hustle and get up there. So, um, I, I kind of tend to use her on maybe some clients that are a little bit more fit. And then, you know, some of the older guys with all due respect, use some of my closer ranging dogs, you know, because Hey, I got a dog on point, 70 yards off to the left, 11 o'clock. They can get there in time. So yeah, every dog has a strength and weakness kind of thing. But, um, yeah, all my dogs are anywhere from 50 to 400 some yards and anywhere between, you know, if I can have a dog cast a hundred, 150, maybe no more than 200, that's probably pretty optimal for a client to get there in time. Um, but that, that's just how I operate. Yeah. I'm kind of similar in that nature. I mean, I, I don't have any dogs that operate at 400 yards, but, um, <clears throat> I'd like to be in that kind of 200 and under, um, Ideally, you know, you work uh, up here with the kind of cover that we have. I like to yeah. be able to work logging roads if if I have to with certain clientele who aren't as physically, you know, fit as myself who will go bus brush through the you know middle of a seven year old aspen cut. But um, so if I can get a dog cast out, you know, 150, 200 yards off the logging road, you know, now we're covering a 400 yard swath. And, sure. um, it, it's a lot easier to get off the logging road and spend time pursuing a dog rather than trying to pursue grouse through the woods with a yeah. client that yeah, yeah. just can't handle it. I'll, unfortunately, I've, I've had, had a, a, a couple older gentlemen who didn't necessarily tell me that they had bad backs and they found out real quickly during the day that they had bad backs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And just this, uh, since this, this past season, it just closed for us. Um, we, 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 I have a, a, a bunch of friends that are, are guiding under my operation and, um, s- some of the, the most common comments, not complaints, you know, kind of thing, but is that the terrain, the clients completely underestimated and you can tell them all you want over the phone and over email, be, be prepared for this and this, you know, good hiking boots and, you know, bring, bring all your weather gear, you know, to Southwest, you know, we don't, don't know what, what, what will get thrown at us, but, um, even some of the clients that say they're, they're in really good physical shape. Some of them just say, man, this is, this is tougher than I thought. And we're thinking, yeah, wait till we get the Merns country. <laughs> wow. We are just in desert bird country. These are easy rolling hills. And I'm not talking shit, of course, you know, about our clients cause we love them. But just this, uh, I've updated our website, you know, after the season closed and now each species, um, hopefully it is red, you know, we'll a little, let our clients know, like expect, you know, six to 10 miles in Merns country, expect eight to 10 miles or even more in desert bird country and expect this elevation because, you know, here, you know, uh, in Tucson where I'm from, we're at like 2,600 feet. So for me to go to 4,500 feet, five, that's nothing, you know, I'm already halfway acclimated. It's not much for me, but when you got guys from the Midwest or say California, they're at sea level and they come out and all of a sudden we're on desert birds at 4,000, like, man, What's the elevation here? Oh, about four or 4,500. Man. Okay. That, that, that makes sense now. You know, they're in really good shape. 
but they have not been acclimated to, you know, and you can't acclimate yourself in three days, you know, to, to that, you know? So it, it is interesting on, on, on what we have to do as outfitters to think, Oh yeah, they don't know this. And again, educating them on so many aspects of the hunt. Yeah. I find it is as transparent and upfront as you can be with your clients. It just helps curb unrealistic expectations. Sure. And that's, you know, the job as an outfitter is to try to align the right expectations with the client, especially yep. before the trip. I mean, the last thing you want is kind of somebody feel like they, they weren't made aware of, of, of this stuff. <laughs> exactly. I thought you said there was Covey as a 40. I never said that. <laughs> <laughs> never said that at all. Oh man. Uh, anything you want to, want to leave the listeners with about, uh, Oh, I'm not even going to attempt it, man. I'm bad with names. It's the, oh, Brock, Brock Du Bourbonnet. Du Bourbonnet. Um, Is that how Du yeah. Bourbonnet? Okay. Yeah. So, what's, what's um, their nickname? Do they got a little nickname you guys call them? Uh, I just, I just, some people call them Brocks, but then you would, then that's kind of the general term, coiner, of course. Yeah. But then there's a Brock Francais, there's a, the Brock Du Bourbonnet, and then the other one, because I don't own it. If any listeners have this one, I'm sorry, but I think it's Brock Du Auvergne. A U V R G N E or something like that. So just from a different part of, of France. So personally, I just call my dogs Bourbonnet. Uh, the easiest way that I can tell people to remember it is take a sip of bourbon, like the alcohol bourbon, but throw the phonetic A at the end, almost like you're Canadian A, eh? but they're not in Canada. Um, so Bourbonnet is, is the easiest way to think. Just like taking some sip of bourbon, but throw the phonetic A at the end. I'm not going to forget that now, A. Eh? A. Exactly. A. I know. Yeah. <laughs> bourbon A. Yeah. I know. You like some bourbon A? Uh, yeah. You're talking about my dog or are you going to pour me a glass? Yeah. Oh, yeah. man. Well, uh, why, don't, why don't we take some time here and uh, just kind of lay the landscape of what you guys offer? Because you do just a little bit more than just upland hunts as well. Yeah. You know, it mainly upland hunting. Uh, it started off, um, you know, offering some, some big game hunts and really my passion kind of shifted, even though our logo incorporates a hoof, uh, within, um, within the logo, but, um, definitely made the shift years ago. Of just, I just want to focus on upland hunt. So yeah, uh, that, that's, that's what we offer. Uh, the three quail species here in Southern Arizona. Um, personally to offer grouse hunts in Arizona, it would definitely be more of a uh, quality, not quantity hunt. And, um, it's such remote area. It would be really hard for clients to get to, uh, unless they have a private jet that they'd be able to fly into a small, really, really, what do you call it? A regional airport, just a small private airport. It'd be hard for, for them to do that. So usually when I do grouse hunting, it, it's all just personal hunts, you know, early in the season, higher elevation. So I can feel that I can safely get my dogs out in, uh, on wild birds and also so I can carry a shotgun myself. Um, but that being said, you know, uh, uh, like back on that rattlesnake, you know, thing with hazards and stuff, you know, we, we do have hazards here in Arizona, rattlesnakes, javelina, that's a big, definitely a big threat. You know, people aren't familiar with them or people call them pigs, but they're a member of the peccary family. It's just a very aggressive pig like animal that, um, that can certainly, uh, attack your dog, if not kill it, um, and then attack you all that. So, uh, that, that's the main reason why I carry a sidearm out there is just to protect, to protect my, uh, myself, uh, dogs and clients, uh, from Havelina. Um, but man, one of the hazards uh, that I got into, into grouse country two seasons ago, uh, one of my friends will be listening to this scooter. He was with me. I'm very fortunate to have him as a friend because he was a hell of a support structure during the time that one of my dogs ate some poisonous mushrooms in, in grouse country, you know, and, Yes. Wow. Again, I got to tell, I got to tell the story. So people don't think, Oh yeah, there's nothing out here. Oh no, there are. Um, almost killed her dude. Almost killed her. She was knocking on death's door. It was, um, it was a pretty emotional experience. And fortunately she did make it out thanks to uh, the vet, um, and, um, and their dedication and all in their love. But, you know, I, I told the, uh, the, uh, the doctor, I said, I know you can't save them all, but please, please save my dog. Uh, sure shit, you know, uh, he and his amazing staff did and her will to live. And since then we've had an, another litter with her. And so we have another generation because of that. But, um, yeah, sorry, I got a little sidetracked on, on the, on the, on the hunting thing, but just to touch on just another hazard out there, it doesn't matter if it's Arizona somewhere. I mean, there's poisonous mushrooms everywhere. Why yeah. the hell she ate a mushroom? I have no idea, Brian. 
you know, uh, I can't ask her, you know, and, and uh, the vet said it and I will agree when a dog eats something like that, they don't have that cognitive recognition of last time I ate that mushroom, I almost died. They, 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 they don't, they don't have that. And so, um, so, you know, on, on a, on a wet summer, I may delay my, uh, my grouse hunt a little bit. So it gets a little bit cooler or, or I may, may just not run her. Last time I ran her, I put a mask, I put a muzzle on her. <laughs> she hated it, but I'm thinking like, you're not eating another mushroom. I'm not driving you an hour and a half to the next vet and almost kill you. Um, um, so yeah, so that being said, um, yeah, we, we just, uh, we offer, uh, offer upland hunts uh, for quail species. Everything that we do out of state, it's all just personal hunts just so we can uh, escape into some colder country and say uh, October and November for chucker hunts or sharp tail, pheasant hunts, whatever else we want, and uh, or just head down to Argentina. Yeah, that was kind of what I wanted to touch on before, you know, we kind of get, get too la- la- lengthy here in the podcast. Um you know, I've heard guys going down to shoot doves and going down to shoot purdies, and I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and waterfowl, you know, but you, you got, you know, some quail going on down there. So what's what's going on down in Argentina, man? Uh, yeah, it's it's pretty special, man. It's pretty uh, pretty awesome. So uh, I networked with a fellow outfitter, colleague, and friend um, who um, – has a quail hunting outfit, uh, down in the Patagonia region. So, um, basically hosting trips, you know, the, the logistics of bringing a dog down there is just ridiculous. It's, I'm not gonna say it's not an option, but it's certainly not, um, ideal. And so they have a good string of dogs, you know, pointers for, uh, for quail and they have a couple of uh, cockers for flushers and then they have a couple uh, black labs there, um, for, uh, for duck hunting too. And so there's ducks and quail down there and, um, just amazing. Absolutely incredible. I'm, I'm heading out, um, here in like five days or so to fly down there with some clients and be down there. And, um, yeah, just epic scenery, man. I mean, just, you know, right along the Andes, uh, mountains and, um, just phenomenal habitat. You know, they, they released the Valley quail, the California quail. I tend to call them Valley quail because I've actually never really gotten into, into California quail in California. It's just another state, so that, that's that's their name. But so they have a bunch of valley quail down there that were introduced, I think, in late '80s, early '90s, or something. And you know, just like the Chinese ringneck pheasant was was released here, you know, for sport, and you know, so the chucker from the Middle East, uh, Hungarian partridges, of course, you know, from Europe. And so they introduced those quail down there, and they have thrived. Their habitat is phenomenal, and um, there's nothing stopping them. You know, they're uh, I wouldn't consider them an, an invasive species, but it certainly do thrive down there. And, um, you know, when, when, when you see a cubby rise of 60 birds get up in the air, you go, Oh shit, it's on. It's, it's, it's pretty, uh, uh, somewhat magical. You know, when you, you look off in the scenery out there and dogs on point, you're walking up there, snow capped Andes and birds are uh, birds are in the air and you're in the Southern hemisphere when it's approaching summer here in the U S they're on the other side. So they're approaching winter down there. It's just a really cool way to extend the season and to offer another service um, where we can't hunt birds here because it's springtime and it's, you know, uh, hatch and broods and chick production and all that kind of stuff. So it's just a way to extend, uh, extend our services and extend the season down there. What's the, I mean, what's the cover type down there? Like, what does it actually like landscape look like? Are you guys hunting grasslands, you know? Or? Yeah. Well, uh, grasslands and creeks, um, some of the areas are treed a little bit, but for the most part, just phenomenal grasslands. It's <laughs> just what, what every quail really wants to thrive in. Um, so yeah, grass cover there is, is fantastic. And the other, um, I, I'm not going to say that they would never receive rain, but when you have all those storm fronts coming off the Pacific and hitting Chile and then they hit the Andes and then they hop over, um, their, their rainfall is, is usually pretty substantial. Um, they have a couple, you know, ski resorts there and stuff. So obviously if there's some snow accumulation there, they, they certainly do have a lot of moisture. Um, and you know, as Argentina squeezes down in that Patagonia region, it gets pretty narrow at the bottom of South America. So you have two oceans, you know, on, on either side there. So they're, um, you know, I guess continentally speaking, they have, they have a lot of water surrounding that, that small, uh, that, that, that small tip of, uh, of Argentina down there. Is it pretty rough country? No, dude, it's easy. 
easy, man. Like walk in the park kind of stuff, man. It's, um, I mean, I don't doubt that, you know, we're, there was some, you know, foothills off in the distance that we could have hunted, but it's like, why beat yourself up when you got a bunch of, you know, good bird numbers down, uh, down in the grasslands. So no, it was, um, easy stuff, man. Uh, you know, I, I would take any range, you know, age range there, you know, I would, I would definitely take guys in their seventies there. No problem at all. Um, are you at a higher elevation or, you know, is it, is it pretty close to sea level? Like where are you at in elevation? No, I mean, you know, so we're, we're at the foothills of the, of the Andes, you know, so we're, we're definitely out there in some elevation, uh, nothing sea level. Like I'll be flying in Winifatis there. And so obviously, you know, that's, that, that's pretty damn, you know, it's the ocean's right, right off in the distance. And so that, that's pretty damn close to sea level. But once you get in the Patagonia region, you're definitely up there. There's a couple of areas down there that, we took a couple of drives and uh, did some scouting last year. And, um, I swear, Brian, if you were, if I were to be blindfolded and dropped in this area and they take off the blindfold, I go sweet. Where the chucker, like straight up chucker country, man. Like, you know, but then, but we just left awesome quail country and, and ducks with a bunch of water, you know, ponds and lakes, uh, you know, trees, you know, in the distance and grasslands. But then this one particular area to where, just doesn't receive a lot of rain, but there's still plenty of quail there because there was a couple of rivers that kind of cut through the area with just phenomenal trout fishing and classic chucker country. You look off in the distance going, man, you probably can't do it nowadays, but if somebody were to drop chuckers here back in the eighties, just like they dropped quail, you'd have a field day. They would, they would thrive. They'd come down for the water and they go right back up to the Rocky Bluffs. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's any cheat grass down there kind of thing, but I'm sure they'd be able to, uh, adapt and, and find something else to eat and, and hang out there. But yeah, it's a uh, very, very diverse part of uh, you know, the Patagonia region. It's just gorgeous. And the food's phenomenal. Uh, wine, just stellar. So it's, um, yeah, can't say enough about that place. We're looking forward to going back. Do you care to share what kind of a trip like that costs a, a, a hunter? And a rough yeah, tail? sure. Yeah, sure. Um, it's pretty much about a grand a day which, you know, by the time you fly down there, it's actually, you know, to some people they are like, Oh shit, a grand, uh, that's, that's out. You know, other guys are like, Oh, it's totally in my wheelhouse. Um, but you know, when it's, when it's all inclusive with lodging and three meals a day, you know, however much wine you want to drink and your wing shooting and you know, the, you take the food back to the chef and he cooks up that duck for, for dinner. And you have some, uh, some quail medallions for an appetizer on this like badass charcuterie board next to the fire at the lodge you go, okay, cool. Sign me up next year. So it's, um, you know, so seven days, seven grand. And, um, you just got to fly there. You just got to get there. But, you know, so, you know, some people have flyer miles and stuff and, you know, that they're looking to burn. So burn the miles and get down there. You know, you just have to fly into Buenos Aires and then take a smaller regional air, uh, uh, airplane to get into a smaller airport. And then from there on, it's all up to us. We, we pick you up at the airport and it's all on us from there. What's a, what's a bag limit on, on birds down there? Like, I mean, is that more of a, uh, if a guy wants to go down and also experience it, yeah. you know, does he, does he get to kill too? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. That, that's it. Yep. The limit's three. Yep. Um, no, you know, funny enough because it's a non-native species, uh, down there. Um, there's, uh, there's no limit. However, uh, the outfitter that we work with, um, he sets his own limit at, I believe 18 a day, but you know, no, nothing against myself behind a shotgun or our clients. It's pretty hard to kill 18 birds, uh, you know, a, a day. And not that the bird numbers don't support it. It's just, you know, they're, they're rockets out there, you know, and it's and again, back to, I don't know, an hour ago or something. It's not all about killing, you know, yeah. but um, it's always nice to have birds in the bag. I, I, I think last year, maybe I killed nine birds or something in one day and I missed plenty, you know, but, that, that's that's the fun of it you know it's um yeah it's yeah it's, it's definitely pretty awesome and then you know the valley quail i mean they're gorgeous birds too just absolutely beautiful down there i, I didn't notice anything different about that bird species versus say oregon where i've hunted them um you know it's you know obviously different genetics you know throughout the you know the last several decades but um it's, it's the same bird, you know, they're, they're, they're st they still fly like rockets and they just happen to have adapted and found a slightly different grass seed food source to be eating and other insects that are hatching during their springtime, which is our winter, you know, kind of thing. So it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty awesome, but you know, just for overall ethics, you know, with the amount of birds that we're seeing in the air, 
you know, he just sets his, he sets his own, his own kind of self-regulated limit, I guess you would call it. But, um, yeah, I haven't even come close to that. So it's fine. And you know, the duck hunting's amazing too. I mean, he has good duck dogs and, uh, you know, decoys and, uh, blind all set up, you know, you hop out there with headlamps and stuff. He's got good gear, you know? And so, um, yeah, pretty epic in the morning, but uh, eventually, you know, time runs out as that sun comes up and those ducks go, what the hell's that movement down there? So you bail out in the morning and then head back to the lodge, change out and you go hit the uplands, man. It's, or if you just want to hunt quail all day, that, that's cool too. You want to go fly fishing, you go kayaking, mountain biking, whatever you want, you know? So it's, um, yeah, the Patagonia region, it's, it's pretty amazing. I got to imagine on that kind of trip, you tend to have a few non-hunting guests. Yeah. You know, some, some, um, some clients, you know, I, I, I will say that, you know, most of the clients are, are men, you know, whether it be here or there. Uh, but it, it is really nice to have lady hunters in, in the field, um, just to, just to break it up a little bit, you know, and, and actually see <laughs> a woman enjoy the same thing that, that, that a man uh, can and, and uh, does enjoy. So it's, Rarely do we have ladies in our, in our field, but this last year between the guys that are working with me and me, I'm going to say we probably had no more than maybe four, which is actually a lot, you know, but, um, yeah, if, uh, if one of my clients wants to head down to Argentina and do some wing shooting and, and the wife wants to go along and doesn't want to be excluded, what do you want to do? Mountain bike, kayak, fly fish, hike, horseback, whatever, whatever. So, I mean, enjoy the know, fantastic with the, the, wine and food. <laughs> oh man. Seriously, you know, it's, um, I, I, you, when, you're going to walk a lot of miles to, to work off that beef. Yeah, when, when you when you said good food and wine, you know, and, and going to Argentina, I'm thinking, you know, not many guys probably can get away with doing that without at least inviting the, the wife. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Whether or not she wants I, I to go is a whole other thing, but hey, you uh, know, exactly. if there's, there's side perks, you know, you, you guy might be able to get his wife to go along. Uh-huh, yeah, th- this year it's uh, two clients from Iowa and – client from New Mexico and California or something. So basically two different groups that, that, that have been with me for several years, you know, and you know, you, you have to make sure that, you know, everyone's going to get along, you know? So if you have two different groups, you know, nobody wants to be in the field or back at the lodge with some jackass that's just, you know, yakking his mouth off and, or some obnoxious guy or some guy that's just, you know, too pretentious and egotistical or whatever. And so you got to make sure that everyone's going to jive well with each other. Everyone's cool and relaxed and utmost importance, make sure that, you know, people are safe, you know, it's uh you know, if, if I were to have to call out somebody for being uh, unsafe in my field, like, you're not going to Argentina. <laughs> we're a long ways from, we're 5,000 miles from home. And, uh, yeah, so it's, you know, safety is paramount on any of our hunts, you know, here, you know, with friends. I mean, you know, even with my friends, you know, like it, it, some people, and we can all be guilty and just being complacent, you know, with, with, with gun safety. And so, you know, anywhere from crossing over a barbed wire fence, yeah, you could, yeah, you could put the safety on. You could hand the gun and say, Hey, safety's on or just take the shells out. And then, you know, or, you know, double guns, man. We love the double guns, you know, just break that sucker open. Unless that thing's going to close and the safety is going to come off and the trigger is going to go. Nobody's probably going to get shot. You know? So it's, and that, that's actually speaking of that. We actually just, this uh, upcoming season, um, we just, uh, I guess I can say we've outlawed, um, auto loaders, you know, uh, under our outfit because, you know, with the name, you know, double arrow guys, like we love double guns. Everyone likes shooting, shooting a double, um, uh, arrow. Uh, uh, some people have wondered, uh, arrow was one of my dogs, you know, when I started the, uh, started the business. And so, you know, I was that guy that just named it after my, my, my current bird dog. And, you know, the legacy will live on when, when she's no longer around, but auto loaders, man, I, uh, there to me, at least being a guide out there, you can see a double gun broken over, whether it be side by side over under that gun's broken over somebody's shoulder or just hanging in somebody's hand. It's that nonverbal communication of that gun is safe. Um, and then you have an auto loader. Like is that, is, is the safety on? Is it off? Well, I'm not quite sure where, where it's at. So we, we've had, we haven't had any close calls, but we've definitely had to um, kind of uh, vocalize, uh, Hey, you got your safety on and to a client. And then you hear, Oh, you got you yeah, safety on click. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> yeah. You could trip, fall and go down fingers in or outside the trigger guide. Yeah. You know, uh, too, too many bad things can happen with a firearm. It's just not worth it. So, um, 
and they throw shells too in Arizona and hopefully other states. Um, throwing shells around there, you know, it's, it's a uh, game to fish. They love giving away tickets for littering out there. And, you know, I got to pick up the shells or, you know, the client could possibly miss another shooting opportunity because they're picking up their own shells. And so, uh, this upcoming season, we're just going double guns only, you know, just, uh, just kind of, uh, and it, it's rare that we do have an auto loader in our field, but the ones that we do have, we're like, we're done. We're, we're, we're done with it. Yeah, that's smart, man. I, I, um, I don't, I, I, I don't, actually guide a lot of clients that have auto loaders uh yeah mo- mostly yeah. guys that have double double yeah. guns and i never thought about mostly it from a safety it, it, safety perspective i that's definitely something i have to personally consider as well i mean i i do a lot of walking yeah. with, with my gun cracked um in certain areas yeah. if i feel like that i'm gonna lose my footing i usually open it up um, exactly and yeah it's i have i have a little safety talk you know and prior to even booking with with my clients you have to i have i have a, a fee that i i float over every one of my clients that you know if, if you shoot one of my dogs it's x amount on the spot yep. and yep. you know, pay for the vet bills or the unfortunate circumstance you have to replace a dog it's this amount you know and which is still not worth it because the dog's no longer around um number one you know you love that dog and then number two you're down on dog power and maybe number three, it's it's a pretty awkward drive home with that client, and uh, and or you're going to the vet vet or something. So it's 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 just just not worth. It. I tell people all the time, an eight ounce spur is not worth your, my, or especially my dog's life. Yeah. So please, please w- w- watch your shooting, and you know, and, and do not approach my dog on point with the barrel facing downward. I don't care how you shoot clays, and I don't care how you've been hunting for thirty years. If your barrel's facing at the ground. I consider that facing at my dog, and that's unacceptable walk with the, the barrel facing upward. Yeah. Is the bird, bird coming off the ground? Yes. Do you plan on shooting on the ground? You better not be. No ground shooting, no rabbit shooting. And like, that's, that's way too close to my dog. Much agreed, man. I, uh, yeah, it's, it's, we said it earlier. We couldn't do our jobs without it. And, uh, nope. I can't have clients endangering my dog's life. And I, I, I don't want to get into that point with with a client. I'd rather <laughs> rather lay the law on the line up front. And if you can't live by yep. those rules, you're, it, it's probably not going to work out for me. Nope. Nope. Um, yeah. So we were going to wrap up a little bit about out state hunter hunting, and you know you've you've kind of hunted all over the country, but um, I don't know if you want to touch on a little bit of that, or if you want to leave a little bit of dribble and drab as to kind of what maybe some of the local etiquette efficacies are and some of the things maybe that you see out of state hunters, not necessarily understanding. Yeah. What do you um, want, which one do you want to grab? <laughs> yeah, let, let, let's, let's go about, yeah, let's just go for hunting ethics. I don't think people need to hear about my, my hunting um, you know, excursions and stuff because they have their own. Um, you know, I, I, a lot of them are just common sense, Brian, you know, just, you know, we, we've all seen it no matter where we hunt. You find something that looks good and you, you park there, you drop some dogs and then some guy comes up and he parks like a hundred yards from you. You, you want to look at that guy going, what the fuck? Dude, there's so much public land out here. Of course, I'm speaking of Arizona, but um, there's plenty of other places, you know, Oregon, there's BLM everywhere and all that. We have a bunch of state trust and national forest here. So like people being up on top of each other and going, well, they're hunting there. It must be good. That That's an in-state plate. And they're not I'm going, man, just judge your habitat. <laughs> There's plenty of it. Find something new. And again, back when I said earlier, like think outside the box, you know, it's just, you know, if you've been here for several days, try something new, but um, you know, and then if you end up, you know, stumbling upon another hunter in the field, what I do, whether guided or not, if we're in close vicinity, of course, say hello, you know, and, and let them know you're here. And that, um, I always, I talk to other people saying, Hey man, um, I, I just want to know, okay, so I'm heading down to say this drainage right here. Where are you going and where have you been? You know, like, I don't want to ruin your hunt anyway. Then I want you to ruin my hunt. And then, Oh, um, more importantly with, with like, for the sake of the bird, if you already, if you already pushed through that drainage, I don't want to be fresh in those birds that have already scattered, you know, like I don't want to be chasing singles. Everybody loves the, the thrill and the rush and the sound of that cubby rise. So, you know, I don't want to be hunting cubbies that are already busted. So, you know, every now and then you'll run into, you know, some assholes, you know, that, you know, 
are just wondering why you're in their spot and like, okay, this is public land here. But uh, for the most part, if you approach it, you know, uh, number one, have back to the double gun, you know, that's, that's why I like that too. You see somebody else in the field. I automatically, if my gun isn't already broken, it's broken open, pull the shells out. There's another person there. You're not going to be pulling the trigger, you know, approach that person. That's that nonverbal communication of my gun is safe. There's no shells in it. Let's have a conversation here. And, you know, back to the auto loader thing going, all right, you just lean that auto loader against the tree. I can't see the chambers open, you know, all that. So yeah, I would say just, just, just be kind to other people out there. Um, you know, it's public land. We're all, we're all public land owners, you know, we're all paying our taxes and stuff. And so just be cordial with, with people and, you know, and obviously if I'm guiding be on that professional level, but being cordial and just, just be nice to people. There, there's, there's too many assholes out there and I, I don't want to be one of those people and try to just be an advocate for being a good, a good ethical hunter and move on, find another drainage. Don't, don't, don't go hopping over on somebody else's hunt that they just push through. Well said, I, I kind of take the same approach. You know, if I see other people, it's, you never know who you're going to run into. Um, no. and, and it, and you just be level and just be a person and, um, you know, who knows, they might be willing to share some waypoints with you. <laughs> you know, it's, sure. <laughs> it's, it's one of those things where you like, especially if you're an out of state or like, you know, and you, you run across somebody, it, it doesn't hurt to talk to them. I mean, nope. you, you don't have to share your waypoints, but you know, like no. I said, you never know. I mean, somebody might go, Hey, you know, like we did really well over there. We're not going to go back. Like, um, you know, if you're here for a few days, maybe you want to try over there in a few days. Yeah. And especially if you see somebody with uh, with like a, a young hunter, you know, like a, like a kid and a, a you know, father, son or you know, father, daughter, or, you know, or whatever, you know, can go and go any way, um, you know, to, to get more, more of the youth, you know, involved in the, in the bird hunting. Cause it, I, I would, one would call it like a dying breed, but you do see a lot of young, younger people out there, which is really nice to kind of keep that up on bird, uh, bird hunting tradition, keeping it going. And so, yeah, if I were to be out there and be somebody else younger, then it, if there would be a young kid, then I would be definitely more apt to say, Hey, we're going to run down here, but that one's been pretty productive over there. Why, why, why don't you go ahead and get, get your kids some birds, you know, kind of thing. Cause that, that would, you know, that would just be awesome, you know, to, to see that happen. And we, we've had a couple of kids in our, uh, in our field. And, um, speaking of touching on that, we, just this past season, we had a uh, father and son out and man, this father and son or this father uh, was like the pinnacle pinnacle of like what you should do with your kid on bird hunting. Uh, it was a, it was a double gun and, the kid walked with it broken open and he was not allowed to close it unless the dog was on point and he was approaching dog, you know, and, and there was, uh, they got Covey F. Scaly's busted out a little bit wild. And our goal was to get this kid a bird and he was very safe, very, um, uh, just so polite, you know, just, you know, sir, yes, sir, all that kind of, but that's just how he was raised. And so I, I still have this in, in, in my mind, like, like, like a video replaying and, the father is running with his gun broken open. The kid, knowing, knowing that we had birds out there and they could just flush wild and, and the kid had his gun upright and the, the father was running and he was holding the barrel of his kid's uh, gun upright just in case this kid fell and he's running, running, running. I'm like, holy shit. I mean, it was, it was so cool to see that. Like he wanted to get his kid a bird, but he knew like, there's a decent chance my, my, if my kid falls, you know, if the gun would go off, and uh, Cubby gets up and he shoots. And I remember the kid goes, you got one, dad? I'm like, oh man, that's so cool. But prior to that, the kid asked a couple times, like, can I close my gun? Not yet, son. You know, like it just, it wasn't time. So it was just really cool to, to see good ethics and safety just instilled in that kid. You know, I'm going to say the kid is probably, I don't know, 12, 13, 14, something, something like that. But, um, we, we don't have a lot of youth in our field, but of course it would have to be with, with a, a, a licensed adult hunter and everything. And of course I asked them questions over the phone uh, way prior to, to the hunt. And if we get an inquiry, yeah, I want to take my, my son on his first wild bird hunt. And I'm thinking, man, I, I'm sure you really do, but or, or he's never been bird hunting before. And I'm thinking, man, at, at your kid's age, you, you probably need to take him on pen race birds. And I'm thinking in the back of my head without telling them your, your kid's going to shoot my dog. <laughs> like, uh, and you know, I can 
you, you know, you know, guiding clients, you can do everything, Brian, but pull the trigger. And when that trigger gets pulled, you can't press stop or rewind on that life remote. You, you can't tell them to stop faster than they can pull that trigger. So they have to make that judgment call, even though you can educate them as much as possible. So it's, uh, there's, you know, one of the hazards out there on, on being an outfitter with firearms and dogs and other humans. It is. <clears throat> It is. Um, you've got, we've got, we've got all of our hat. You don't have wolves down there. So, <laughs> uh, al- although it's not probably as big of it, it's, it's probably equally as big of an issue. I would say as, as snakes, I would say probably more snakes get hit though. There are more dogs get hit by snakes than, than wolves, at least in the upland community, especially up North, but it's still out there and it's still one of those hazards just like, you know, not being able to take back that trigger pull. And it's just part of, part of the inherent dangers of, of messing around with Uh, firearms Yep, and a lot of quick decisions. The the grouse woods, man, I mean, you don't have time to aim. You, you got to put the gun up and you got to pull the trigger Mm -hmm. a lot of times and you have to make that judgment call really kind of prior it all. It's all prior to being able to pull that trigger. And then maybe you get a chance to pull the trigger. Well, I, I mean, I could, I'm sure we could keep going and I probably could. Oh, I'm sure we could. I'm pretty sure. And, the, the, I'm sure yours is empty at this point, but. My beer is definitely empty right now. <laughs> and I, the, 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 the listeners may be falling asleep or they may be just completely engulfed in it. Who knows? Is there anything you want to wrap up tonight with? You know, I, I, I think we've pretty much covered most of the topics that we discussed. I, I think we're all good, man. I, I really do appreciate you uh, inviting me on your show and. Uh, looking forward to uh, listening to my beautiful voice yet once again for an hour and 43 minutes that we have going on right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, how can people get a hold of you if they want to book a hunt, man? I, I guess I'll, yep. I'll, I'll give you one more opportunity to plug the business, yep. and I'll include some links as well in the show notes. I gotcha. Yeah. Um, I made the domain pretty easy. It's quailarizona.com. So that's how you can uh, find the website and cruise through all uh, all the cool pictures and stuff and get to uh, figuratively meet myself and, and the other awesome guides that we have in our outfit. They're all just really good friends of ours and uh, good dogs and a full array of dogs. You know, you want to hunt with a Brittany, we got those. You want to hunt with some German Shoyers, we got those. You got a Satter, sure. You want to have a sip of bourbon? While hunting, you know, hey. uh, <laughs> hey, hunt, hunt behind some bourbon, a, you know, uh, that and, um, uh, social media, Instagram is gun dog run. I started that a long time ago. I guess I probably should have just thrown the business name in there, but I was kind of just went, you know what? It just rolls off the tongue. So it's, uh, I don't think that really matters on an Instagram handle these days, but gun dog run is how you can keep up with uh, what's going on. You can certainly, uh, check in to see how the Argentina hunt uh, will be going. I'll probably, I have Wi-Fi down there at a couple lodges, so I'll probably do daily updates and stuff on that so you can follow along with that. And uh, there's a part on the toolbar, uh, Argentina hunt, so you can check out some pictures and the lodging and, and the amazing food and all that. So uh, by all means, cruise, cruise around. We have a bunch of uh, stickers uh, in our in our shop, so if you hit the shop toolbar. Um, yeah, you do have we some have cool custom- stickers, man. Thanks, man. Uh, it, it's those, uh, most of them are just, you know, the, the six North American um, um, or uh, quail species, but we have some other ones that kind of cater to the Sonoran Desert, like the Gila Monster, Western Diamond Rack, uh, Roadrunner, which are quail killers, by the way. So, um, you know, they, they, they love hitting the, hitting the chicks. The Gila Monsters love hitting the nest and eating the eggs before they even hatch. So the, those are two, two, uh, two little bastards that, uh, uh, they're, they're, they love quail just as much as you and I do. Um, and then I, I have fun with a couple of designs, things that kind of keep me up at night or wake me up at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, you can check out the, uh, quail pale ale, uh, series that we released, uh, I don't know, I guess last year or the beginning of the year, a bunch of all, all, all six quail on like a beer can sticker. And then we have the six pack. And so all, all six quail are tucked into six pack holder, like bottles, but like all the quail heads are sticking out the top. So you can check those out. I'm going to say they're totally reasonably priced for what people spend and what people charge for stickers, which is ridiculous. Um, I'm kind of, kind of a sticker whore myself. I love putting stickers on, uh, you know, anything, but I kind of figure for three bucks, that's definitely a pretty reasonable rate where you could go to any, any other 
touristy place and spend five plus seven dollars and people still eat them up. So, you know, we, we, we just, we like having fun with that kind of stuff. And then we also have first aid kits too. If I can plug marsupial gear here at the end of the podcast, uh, amazing company to work with. Uh, they are in Phoenix and, um, uh, Jim Graham over there that owns marsupial gear. If people have heard of them, they're definitely known for their optics, um, um, you know, pouches for their, their chest packs. They diversified into rifle cases, shotgun cases, uh, any pouch that you want, they got it. And they diversified into, um, Upland bird vests several years ago. So, uh, I latched onto them and we, um, uh, very proud to be running their gear. I'll be running it down in Argentina and bringing a couple of vests for the outfitter down there, uh, as a gift and, um, great vest. Please check out Marsupial gear and you will not be disappointed. Um, um, Jim may be able to correct me on this. I'll say 90 plus percent of his textiles are actually from the U S and, uh, he's very proud of it. And of course, everything's manufactured in Phoenix there in Arizona. Um, great facility. You can, if you're here in Arizona, drop into the Phoenix area, you can try on anything you want. They have a great showroom, bunch of badass mounts there. And, um, our first aid kits, they actually manufacture our bags. So we're proud to, to say that we're, uh, we've uh, kind of collaborated with them and partnered up with them for them to make our first aid bags. And so, uh, you can buy the first aid kit from them or you can buy the first aid kit on ours. It's called first aid K nine. And, um, you can certainly check it out. I'd say all the essentials are certainly in there. We're working on making a smaller kit for somebody who doesn't want to carry a two pound kit. Sounds like a lot, but it's that whole better to have it, not need it, than need it, not have it kind of, kind of thing. And so, you know, I carry more than two pounds of water. So, uh, and plus a shotgun. So two pounds of, uh, pretty essential first aid supplies. I think it's totally well worth the wait, but we are making a smaller kit just in case that somebody wants to carry like a one pound kit and then get back to the truck and then, open up your full kit and then of course then head off to the vet and make sure that your dog is safe. Everything is human grade in the kit so you can use it for yourself other than the th- thermometer. You just stick the thermometer in your dog's butt. I would not recommend putting it in your mouth. <laughs> other than that, you know, it's, it, that, that's like a one-time use, you know, like you know, uh, for you, you know, once it goes in the dog's butt, you know, it, it belongs to the dog. After that, everything else is human grade in there and the bag is just awesome. It's very well very well um, constructed. Uh, zippers are awesome. Clear view pouches. You open it up, you can see everything um, uh, in that in that hectic, you know, uh, uh, time of emergency. Uh, it is Molly capable, so you can strap it on to anyone's bird vest that accepts the Molly system. So that's that's my marsupial uh, gear plug because they're a great great company to work with. So certainly check them out if you're looking for uh, a, another or new bird vest. It's very well constructed lifetime warranty kind of thing. If something happens to fail on it, send it back and they'll repair it for free. And, and he's a big advocate for that. Um, he has a huge following on Instagram. So check him out there. He's, they put out funny videos too, man. Just they're having so much fun over there and, and, and putting out a really great product. Uh, a lot, several of my friends are on our studio gear as well and our clients. So please check them out. Yeah, they do make some good stuff. I will say I, I run a hunt ready, but marsupial gear is definitely on my radar and probably a number two if I'm going to upgrade or change my bird vest. Sure. They, yeah, caught, sure. Name, caught, name drop me, man. Yeah. Name drop me. You know, it's, it's not who you know, it's who you... Wait, never mind. I can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and they... What I really like that they came out first with that kind of pared down smaller vest. Um, yep. especially that, that's what I'm taking Argentina. Where, um, uh, I'm taking the, their, their feather light system. Yeah. You know? Cause I'm not, I'm not running dogs down there. So I don't need to carry a bunch of water. So, uh, I have my, my, uh, the upland or uh, what I consider my guide invest here in Arizona for all my gear. And then I'm bringing three feather lights down one, one from myself and then one for each of the other uh, guys and outfitters down there. Yeah. That, that, that caught my eye and I, I'm just a, you know, if I can buy American made, I'm going to buy American made and there's only a few companies. Definitely. And, they came on my radar. I'm 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 not a fad guy either. Like I kind of look for you know stuff that's as good or better that not everybody else is buying. So <laughs> marsupial yeah. gear yeah. definitely hit my radar for that. And uh, yeah. I, I wish uh, I wish you know those companies the best and want to support them. Yeah, I, I've bounced around through a bunch of different bird vests as a lot of people have. But then once you find that one that truly does work and fits you, fits your body ain't broke don't fix it just uh so it, it, it it's definitely not broke <laughs> and it doesn't need to be fixed but you know what i mean it, it works for me and so um 
you know, uh, they're, and they're Arizona company. company, man. You got to support them at, at this point. Of where you're at. <laughs> well, Matt, I, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I really appreciate the time you made here for the listeners. Likewise. Now, Thank you very much for having me. You uh, ever want to come back? I got an open door policy with gas. So, yeah, no problem at all. I mean, you know, nobody wants to uh, hear me ramble for an hour and 51 minutes again, but you know, may, maybe sometime uh, next year or in the future, if something something changes, um, you know, some updates, I'd be happy to hop back on the show and hang out with you for a little bit longer. Right on, man. Thank you for checking out another episode of the Amazing Outdoors podcast. I am Brian Mays. Spring is here. I wish you all a good, safe endeavors here in the springtime, hunting, training, and, uh, of course, fishing as well. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to go enjoy the weather, and uh, I hope you all see some of I hope to see some of you all at Backcountry Hunters and Anglers Rendezvous in downtown Minneapolis this weekend. Um, I guess I'm going to remind you to like, share, subscribe, and tell a friend about this episode. It all helps grow the show. I will catch you guys on the next episode. I'm out of here. Mm-hmm.